Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, a three-time award-winning show that aims to motivate and inspire you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media, especially in relation to adventure and physical challenges. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. This month, the Tough Girl Podcast is sponsored by Zolio. Zolio connects with your phone to provide seamless global messaging that follows you in and out of mobile network coverage, plus added safety features you can count on worldwide, including industry-leading SOS alerting features, 24-7 monitoring, and 24-7 access to non-emergency medical advice, check-ins, and weather forecasts. Stay connected and safe with Zolio while doing what you love. And I am currently doing what I love. I am out walking the Tiararoa Trail in New Zealand. I've just started at the top of the South Island and will be heading 1,400 kilometres or 870 miles down to Bluff, where I will finish my journey in early March. I'm keeping connected with my family through Zolio and giving them peace of mind that they can track me and know that I can reach out if I ever need help. More information about Zolio and the Tiararoa Challenge can be found at toughgirlchallenges.com forward slash challenge with Zolio. My name is Sarah Thomas, and I am a super long distance open water swimmer, and I am based out of Colorado in the USA, and I am super excited to chat with everyone today and kind of share part of my story. Um, I will give a warning. Um, I did a really long, massive swim this past weekend, and my throat is a little bit hoarse um, from the water and all that fun stuff. So if my voice cracks, I apologize. Um, I'm doing my best over here. You are doing fabulous. And I'm, I'm so excited to hear more about your swimming and your super long distance swimming as well. But where did it all start for you with swimming? Do you, what's your earliest swimming memory? Were you thrown into the pool as a little girl? You know, did your, did your parents take you out swimming? You know, what did that look like? So the family story is that my mom um, was pregnant with my little sister. Um, we're 13 months apart and she was born in July. And so my mom was massively pregnant and needed to cool off. And so she had us signed up for parent taught swim lessons um, by the time I was about one. And she just said, I took to the water. She said, it was just crazy to compare me to like all the other little babies that were in the water that, you know, they were screaming and throwing fits and afraid to go under. And I was happy to jump off the side and get dunked and just obviously loved the water from a very young age. So that's obviously when you were incredibly little, when you, I was going to say, when you had like consciousness, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you were, when did you start realizing the you just love the water. You know, was was there a point as you were getting like older? Yes, I mean it's still pretty young, I would say. But uh, some of my earliest memories are definitely being, you know, at the swimming pool in the summer. You know, with my mom and my sisters. Uh, my family had um, a lake house in Oklahoma, I and mean, we would spend a lot of time out there. So, you know, my earliest, like, happiest memories are just being on the water and in the water, and just being comfortable and just loving everything that had to do with the lake and the swimming pool. But uh, the summer that I was six, um, we were visiting my dad. So my parents divorced when I was pretty little. And so we were spending time with my dad and he signed my sister and I up for formal swim lessons, which was the first time I like actually remember having formal, like actual real life swim lessons. And, you know, the swim lessons were like first thing in the morning. And then after our lessons, the summer league swim team kids would start coming in. And I just remember watching them and being in awe and just like begging my dad, like, please sign me up for swim team. I really, really want to be on the swim team. Please, please, please. And I think I was persistent enough that he said, you know, if you do good in your swim lessons this year, I'll sign you up for swim team next summer. And so I gave, you know, I did my very best little six-year-old impression of swim lessons, um, but my dad did hold true to his promise and he signed me up for summer league when I was seven. And I did that for a couple of years and then um, kind of back home with my mom, we had moved to Texas and um, right before I started fifth grade. So I think I was like nine or 10. Um, she asked me, she was like, Hey, I know that you really enjoy, you know, the summer swim team with your dad. Do you want to be on a year round swim team? And I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. Yes, please sign me up. And so I think kind of from then on, I have just always 
been swimming. You know, I swam all the way through high school. I swam in college for the University of Connecticut. When I finished college, I thought I was going to be just a retired swimmer and tried other sports. But it was just a couple of years later, I was like, I need to get back to the pool. And it was at that point when I got introduced to open water swimming. And like my life changed when someone was like, hey, Sarah, you should do open water swimming. I like put them off. I'm like, that sounds crazy. I don't know. I'm a pool swimmer. I don't know about this open water stuff. You know, I grew up in Texas where the lakes are a little bit questionable. Like, I don't know about jumping into lakes with snakes and can't see the bottom. And I don't know. So it, it took a little bit of convincing. But the first open water race that I did, I just was like, okay, this is it. I found my thing. This is where I should have been all along. Were you spotted? Like, like, was there a swim coach or someone who was like, you are naturally talented at swimming? I remember early on, like my swim coach telling my mom that I had a lot of potential and I was young enough. I didn't know what the word potential meant. And so like, I'm like, what did, you know, what did coach Henry mean when he said I have potential? Um, and my mom, you know, said, it, it means if you keep training and keep working really hard, you could be a really top tier, top level swimmer. And I was like, that's really cool. I, I I want to do that. And so I did, you know, I I would say if you talk to any of my coaches growing up, they would tell you I'm probably the hardest worker that they ever had because I did. I worked so hard. You know, I gave every swim practice like 110%. But I was always a pretty average pool swimmer. You know, I grew up in Texas where swimming is super competitive. If you wanted to make state at the high school level, you pretty much had to have Olympic trial cuts um, or close to them. And that was not the caliber of swimmer that I was or was ever going to be. And so when I went to swim in college at the university level, you know, I just walked on. Um, I didn't have a scholarship. They just let me come on board. I think they let me stay because I made really good grades. So I helped the team GPA average quite a bit. But, you know, I was just very average in the pool, just middle of the road, worked really hard, loved the water, loved being part of the team. I think swimmers are the greatest humans on the planet. And so I stuck with it, even though I was just pretty, pretty middle of the road, nothing special. That's so fascinating. The difference between being, and I'm, I'm going to use your words here, like an average pool swimmer, and then I'm going to use my words, and a phenomenal open <laughs> water swimmer. Why, why, why do you think that is that difference? I don't know. I think some of it really has to do with the distance. You know, it's like the farther I swim, the better I get. And, you know, the longest pool race is a mile. And that apparently is not far enough for me. And so I don't think any amount of work in the pool would have gotten me, you know, to be elite at a mile. But I can translate all of that work, all that effort, you know, all of those training hours into being really good at 20 miles or more. Oh, this is fascinating. So when you when you left college, did you did you continue your, your, your swimming? Were you popping down to the pool, or were you sort of focusing more on your career? And you know what sort of happened in that interim, like after college, and then getting back to the pool? Yeah, there was about two years where I didn't really swim a whole lot after college. Um, I went to grad school. You know, I moved from. Um, I'd went to college in Connecticut, so I moved from Connecticut to Colorado, which is all the way across the United States. So, you know, I was focused on grad school. I was focused on working and getting a job, you know, all kinds of other life things were definitely a bigger priority. So I would go to the pool occasionally, but nothing, nothing real consistent. You know, I tried something like triathlon stuff. You know, I tried like other ways to exercise um, really terrible when it comes to gravity involved sports like running and biking. Um, that is not those sports are not made for me. And so um, I think it made sense that at some point I came back to the pool, but it did. It took me a couple of years to realize like, all right, Sarah, give up on this other stuff. Get back to the pool. That's where you actually belong is in the water. And going back to that time where, you know, trying your first like open water swimming, was that immediate for you where you were like, oh, hold on. This is my job. This is, this yeah, is my, it was, this, was it? Wow. Yeah, it was, an, it was just like an immediate like I remember in the middle of the race. Um, so I did like a 
like a shorter, like just get used to it, open water race in prep for a 10 K open water swim. And so the first open water race that I did, I remember there was someone from my master's team there and he was like, so do you know what you're doing? And I was like, no, I don't have a clue. And so he gave me like a brief, like two minute one oh one on like how to sight. And like, he was like, Sarah, you should probably just get in the water and like loosen up a little bit. So, you know, like aren't shocked when you're jumping in. And so I remember coming out of that first, just like super short race thinking like that was a good time, you know, and like I'm pretty good here. And then going into the 10 K race, like two months later, just like halfway through, I was like, this is amazing. And like, I'm not even kidding. When I was walking out of the water at the end of it, I was so close to tears because I was like, this is it. Like, I loved this, you know, this is my niche. This is what, I mean, this is where I belong. Like, why didn't I do this for the whole rest of my, you know, my life before this, like I've been all wrong all these years. And um, it was just like this incredibly eye-opening moment where I was like, this is what I need to keep doing. This is what I truly love. That must have been an incredible experience. Like yeah. just that that moment, that realization. Yes. How did you progress it? Like how what did you do next? Like how did you think, right, I want to do more of this? Like how did you go about actually doing more of what you love? It was a slow build, I'll say. Um, so this first open water race was in 2007. And I know it's hard to uh, imagine this, but the internet wasn't like a super huge thing in 2007. And so it was hard to learn about other open water things that were out there. And so, you know, for like 2007, 2008, 2009, I just did that same open water 10K race, you know, every year. It was in August. So I did that three times. And I was like, God, I wish there was something else. Like, what else can I find out there? You know, um, doing that race, you know, I interacted with a few people who had done something like swim the English channel. And I remember thinking like, whoa, that's crazy. I can't believe people actually like swim the English channel. But I wasn't at that point yet where I was like ready to even comprehend doing something like the English channel. But, you know, by 2008, I was like, I think I can go farther than a 10 K. Uh, and so really just trying to dig in and like brainstorm, like, what can I do? What can I try? And so I eventually, I, I met someone and he was like, you should try to swim the Catalina channel. You know, it's about 20 miles. It's not as crazy as the English channel. And he was like, I think you can do it. And so for 2010, I signed up to swim the Catalina channel and, you know, trained for it, got a lot of help from some local people who had done stuff similar and, you know, followed some training plans that they put together for me and went to Catalina, like totally, like never had swum at night, you know, like never really been in the ocean all that much. And it was just like this, like huge, scary thing to jump off a boat at, you know, basically midnight and start swimming across the ocean. And you're like, what am I doing? This is maybe a mistake. And I did, I finished the Catalina channel and I'm sitting on shore and like my arms were done. And I, I told everyone like, okay, that was it. That was far enough. Like, I think I'm done with this open water, long distance stuff. I'm over it. And they all laughed and they're like, okay, sure, Sarah. And it did, it took me about three months, I think, to recover from Catalina. And then I was like, you know what, about that English channel thing. And so, you know, I basically right away booked an English channel slot for 2012, decided to sign up to swim around Manhattan for 2011, just to kind of like keep practicing so that I was ready for the English channel. And then, you know, things just started to escalate from there. How was it training for the English channel in America? Yeah, it was a little bit of a challenge. I'm not going to lie. You know, I live in Colorado and we are very far from the ocean. If you look on a map, you know, I don't even know what the closest ocean is, but you basically have to get on an airplane because you cannot feasibly like drive to do ocean training. And so I really did have to just make do with the cold water lakes that are around here and freshwater and saltwater are definitely different experiences. Um, I, where I live, I definitely have access to cold water. So I wasn't too worried about getting the cold water training in, but you still never quite know what's going to happen differently between freshwater and, and saltwater when you, when you get to it. So, you know, it was definitely, you know, two years of, okay, how can I get to an ocean? How can I get some training in, you know, in saltwater? And just 
you know, lucky because here in Colorado, there are a handful of people who have swum the English Channel. So definitely like drawing off of the wisdom and experience of just my local swim community. Even just saying the words cold water, I'm just like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't even like holding a glass with ice in. I have to wrap a kitchen <laughs> roll around it because it's too cold for my hands. How are you in cold water? Like, is it just, what does it, like, do you, <laughs> obvious question. Do you not feel the cold? Do you not feel cold? Oh, I definitely feel cold. When I did that very first open water race, it was about 22 degrees. So relatively warm by most everyone's standards. Um, And I was freezing in the middle of it. Like I remember stopping like, God, I'm getting cramps in my calves because I am so cold. And so that was where I was coming from was like, okay, this water, you know, in the twenties is really cold to me. And now I have to get ready to do this English channel where it's going to be a lot colder than that. And so I do think over over time, you can really acclimate to colder temperatures and it's work. You know, you can't just flip the switch and say, okay, I'm going to do cold water now. You know, it does. It takes years to, you know, build up your tolerance of like gradually doing longer swims in colder water. And so by the time I got to the English Channel, I was definitely prepared for it. Um, but, you know, I mean, that first open water swim was in 2007 and the English Channel was in 2012. You know, so, you know, it took that long to be ready for cold water. Do you have cold showers then? No. What? <laughs> I absolutely refuse to take a cold shower. <laughs> I, I love a long, hot shower, and there is nothing that will take that away from me ever. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting because I'm sure I remember reading about another open water swimmer, especially when they were training for mm-hmm. cold water um, events, challenges, that actually they never they never let themselves have like hot water. So it was always cold water. <laughs> yeah. I hear people that do that. And I think it's the most insane thing I've ever heard because like we deserve warm showers. It's one of the greatest luxuries in life. And I will not give that up. So what do you remember most about your first English Channel swim in 2012? It's kind of a crazy story. So my original slot was for July, like mid-July of 2012. And we, you know, hung out in Dover for two weeks and the weather was absolutely horrific the entire time we were there. It was rainy and windy. I think of like all of the boat pilots, um, you know, everyone that was waiting during that particular window, I think one person went out um, across the board that whole time. And it was just, it was tough conditions. I think the swimmer that I am now probably would have said, like, I want to give it a try. But the swimmer I was then was like, heck no, do not put me in that water. And so it was really tough two weeks of like being in Dover and just watching it blow, you know, and like you couldn't even argue that it was like swimmable water because you just look out over the channel and you could just see the white horses everywhere, you know, like it's windy, it's cold, like no part of me wanted to give it a try. And so we went home, we waited our two weeks in Dover and the opportunity did not present itself. So we left, we went back home. And a few weeks later, um, I got a message from my boat captain and he was like, Hey, someone else dropped, you know, the weather forecast is looking great. Do you want to come back? And I was like, this is crazy. No one goes to England twice in one summer, you know, like that's a long trip, (laughs) you know, like this is crazy. You know, it was crazy that I went to England one time. Now you're asking me to come twice. But, you know, I like talked to my boss and she was like, Sarah, you got to go back. And so I kind of had to reform crew members. You know, my mom is a teacher, so she was able to, you know, come off, come back with me because she was off from work. Um, I had another friend who was on a sabbatical and she was like, I would love to come. And so we went back just, you know, in August. So I think it was maybe like six weeks in between and like everything was different. I was like, oh, the sun does shine in England. I had no idea. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, so, and so we were there for like two days and the boat captain was like, Hey, all right, it's time to go. And I was like, I can't believe this is like actually going to happen. And so we had just like the most beautiful swim. You know, we started at like seven in the morning. It took me 11 hours. So I, you know, the whole swim was just during the day. It was 
beautiful conditions, you know, maybe a little bit of wind, but nothing significant. And I just remember swimming the whole time and just feeling like overwhelmingly grateful, just like I am in the English channel, you know, coming off six weeks prior when I didn't think I was going to even have a chance to swim the English channel. It was really just important to me to be like, I am so grateful that I am here and I am going to enjoy every moment of this because I almost didn't get the opportunity. Oh, I love that attitude. And on the flip side of that, have you ever fallen out of love with swimming? I definitely need breaks. You know, sometimes, especially after a long summer where you've just trained and trained and trained and, you know, sometimes you do have to take a step back and just be like, okay, let's try something else for, you know, a month or two and then get my, you know, get my motivation back because you do. I mean, it's a lot. Um, It's a lot of alone time face down in the water. When it's like, you know, I'd like to do something on land. I'd like to see some trees or some deer, you know, do something that doesn't involve being wet. Do you set yourself like swim goals? I wouldn't necessarily call it like a goal per se, but, you know, I will say, you know, I, I swam from England to France and, you know, had this just beautiful, glorious swim. And I remember like standing on this beautiful French beach and looking back and thinking, I could swim back right now. Like I feel good enough. I could make it back to England guaranteed. And so it was kind of in that moment where I was like, I think I want to try longer swims. And so that um, English channel swim was in 2012. And so 2013, I was like, you know, I want to see if I can swim down and back across Lake Tahoe. It's a beautiful body of water. Like, I really think I can do this swim. And it's like a 42 mile swim. Um, Water temperature is really similar to the English Channel. And I was like, no one's ever done it. You know, I knew someone who had tried and failed. And I was like, I think I want to, I really think I want to try and swim for 42 miles. And that, you know, was kind of the beginning of like, okay, what can I find out there that's a first that hasn't been done or, you know, something that's really going to stretch me beyond, you know, just this 20 mile range of swimming. Thinking about that, that Lake Tahoe, the the longest swims going beyond the 20 miles, when you start getting up to these distances of like 42 miles, mentally, what's going on inside, inside your head, especially when the distances are getting longer the time that you're in the water is getting longer you you know what changes at that level it's really an interesting experience for sure to just like mentally grasp that I'm going to swim for 24 hours today so when I did Tahoe the first length of Tahoe took me about 10-15 minutes longer than the English channel And, you know, kind of, we were following English channel rules. So the rule on that is, you know, you have to exit the water, you know, clear, you know, clear the water, and then you have to kind of immediately re-enter the water, but you have 10 minutes to kind of eat something or like reapply grease or whatever you need to do to kind of prepare to swim back. And so I remember, you know, it's one or two in the morning and I'm sitting on this beach in, in Tahoe and I'm like, I just swam the farthest that I've ever swum. And now I'm going to do it again. And it's just like, this is crazy. You know, like if you logically think about something like that, like you're never going to finish it, right? You cannot think about like, okay, I just swam for 11 and a half hours. Now I'm going to go back and swim 11 and a half hours again. So for me, the trick has just always been, okay, what comes next? You know, so I'm sitting on that beach my husband is next to me and he's, you know, handing me some snacks to eat. And we're not talking about swimming all the way back across Tahoe. Again, we're talking about what do you want to eat now? What do you need when you get back out to the boat? You know, you've got to start swimming again in 10 minutes, you know, so there's no talk about quitting. There's no talk about like, Hey, do you just want to get back on the boat and call it a day? Um, you just, you, you keep moving forward, but in small increments. Um, so, you know, you can always swim for 30 minutes, you know, and that, you know, when you're in the middle of something crazy like that, that's all it is. It's like, okay, I'm going to go for another 30 minutes until they throw me my next feed bottle. And it's just 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And that's just what you focus on is small bite-sized chunks. In terms of the mental side, what do you do any, anything specific before you take on these challenges? You know, I don't necessarily think that I do. 
you know, for me, the mental strength comes from knowing that I trained as hard as I possibly could. And then I'm going into a swim as prepared as possible. And so when you start a swim and you know that you have done everything in your power to be ready for it, then you have just like this quiet confidence in a way to say like, okay, I, I did my part. Now let's hope and pray that the the weather and the water allow me to continue to keep going. One of the other amazing swims that you did was in 2017. Would you like to share a little bit more about the, your record-breaking swim there? Um, so let's see here. In 2017, I decided to try and break my own record for the longest continuous swim. And so I went to Lake Champlain, which is in um, kind of on the border of New York and Vermont, up far north part of the lake goes into Canada. And so the the goal was to swim over 100 miles in Lake Champlain without stopping. And it was just, I don't even know where to start. It was such a, a monster swim. But it was a distance that I... I really wanted to see if I could break, you know, I had done an 80 mile swim the year before that and felt like I had a lot left in the tank. And so, you know, kind of going back to my childhood and my swim coach telling me that I had a lot of potential. I think as an adult, it's always been important to me to feel like I am meeting my potential and, you know, doing everything that I can. And so taking on a hundred mile challenge in Lake Champlain was my way of like, okay, am I fulfilling my potential? You know, 80 miles wasn't far enough. I can go farther. Let's see what I can do to like max myself out here. 67 hours in the water. You swam like, you know, 104.6 miles. Incredible. So (laughs) so I haven't done a lot of swimming. And I'm just thinking, sometimes I spend 40 minutes in the bath and my fingers (laughs) turn turn a little bit pruney. Uh-huh. 67 hours what does that do to your body are you not you know, how can they do not turn into like a giant prune like mm-hmm. how does that even work with like your skin yeah it doesn't um feel great <laughs> I'm not gonna lie um, if I feel like I'm a little hoarse right now um, I will say after Lake Champlain I remember my husband kind of laughing at me and telling me that I sounded like Darth Vader because like every time I would breathe in it was like <gasps> because you're just you know your throat gets swollen your your skin gets so pruney like you look at it underwater and you're like is it coming off like do I still have skin and no it's still there but it does get really wrinkly and um it's actually kind of surprising because after a long swim like that it's really your skin's really dry so it's like you're almost bathing in lotion to like catch up because it's like I had too much moisture for too long how long does it take for your skin to go back to normal you know, faster than you would, uh, you might think, you know, I would say within just a few hours, the pruniness goes away. You know, the dryness lasts a couple of days. I um, mean, the throat stuff usually lasts a few days as well. But otherwise, your body, you know, recovers pretty well as long as you're keeping yourself very well hydrated. So you're getting sort of regular feeds every 30 minutes, 67 hours. I get peeing, like no issue at all. <laughs> you can probably swim and sure. pee. But do you ever yes. get the urge to poo (laughs) you know it happens occasionally um it did happen in 67 hours um just once and so it's not I don't know it's not exactly pleasant (laughs) I'm not gonna lie (laughs) but um no you just kind of have to take care of business would you just swim through it sorry to get Greg (laughs) would you swim through it or would you like like is it going to be a <laughs> is it a solid poo basically coming out or is your yes. body it is oh okay it's, yeah and so and I do have to stop I know some people who have had like diarrhea on swims and they kind of swim through that yeah um but I've never been able to keep swimming and taking care of that kind of business definitely for peeing you know you don't even know that I'm peeing but I always kind of have to stop for a few minutes and be like okay let's get this out my stomach hurts oh and so just basically pull the costume aside. Boom, yes. Get it done. Yeah. yeah. Move on. Yeah. Are you also talking about the the nutrition and what you're eating for for that length of time? Because I'm just thinking of how your digestion is affected. Does your digestion get affected when you're swimming these longer distances? It does a little bit. Um, and I'll say I have some, my husband did a hundred mile trail run just like a couple of months ago. Like it was his first like big, super long race. And so it was really interesting for me to compare like what I go through from a digestive perspective in a hundred mile swim um, compared to what he was dealing with on a hundred mile run. 
I think one of the advantages that we have in swimming is that we've got a boat next to us the whole way. And so they can carry like all of our liquids and all of our water. And so I think it makes things a little bit easier because there are products out there that I think are a little bit easier on the stomach. You know, my husband was eating a lot of gels and trying to eat like mashed potatoes. And I'm I'm not sure he was getting quite enough water in his mix. And that really like threw off his stomach and his digestive issues. Whereas, you know, like I can feel it in my stomach and it usually takes a couple of days after a long swim to like get everything kind of back to normal. But just the, you know, the things that I'm able to eat generally like agree with my stomach. And so usually when I'm swimming, you know, I'm getting the nutrition that I need just in the form of like carbohydrates and some protein all in liquid form. And that usually just keeps me pretty satisfied and happy for most of a long swim. You know, sometimes we throw in things like rice or um, had some oatmeal um, in the English channel, you know, so there are, you know, some solid foods that you can eat, but you know, if you kind of just stick to your plan and make sure you're getting enough calories and getting enough hydration, stuff just kind of cycles through the way that it, it should. Do you ever get cravings when you're in the water? Yes. I will say early on, you know, because the general advice was you only need carbohydrates. Don't consume any protein. Protein can mess up your stomach, you know, and all these warnings about not eating any protein. But particularly early on, I would like crave giant cheeseburgers. So I'd be swimming and like, I want a cheeseburger right now. (laughs) Um, I remember going down the Hudson River in the um, swimming around Manhattan. um, And they were asking me like, what do you want? And I'm like, a cheeseburger. And so the boat captain was like really into it. And he would like come out at my feed stops and he'd be like, do it for the cheeseburgers. (laughs) And so, you know, I started after that, I was like, okay, my body is clearly telling me that I need some protein. If all I can think about is big giant hamburgers when I'm swimming. And so, you know, I've kind of got a good mix in my nutrition now where I don't usually crave a whole lot. Um, On the swim I did last weekend, you know, I was having a little bit of stomach issues in the middle. Um, And my crew was like, do you want anything? And I'm like, nothing sounds good other than what I'm already doing. And so, you know, we kind of problem solved through it and just, I started drinking a little bit more water and that solved my problem perfectly. Um, Cause I'm like, I don't want cookies. I don't want any bananas. You know, I don't really want an apple. I don't know what I want, you know, like, so if you're doing it right, I think you don't crave anything. After your incredible swim, 67 hours, late. Ch- Chamberlain, Chamberlain. Um, Champlain. Hun- <laughs> Sh- what was it again? <laughs> Champlain. <laughs> Champlain. Sounds like Champlain. Uh, Lake Champlain. It does. <laughs> um, 104.6 miles. Incredible. You must have felt sort of on top of the world. And then a couple of months later, well, do you, do you want to share what happened a couple of months later? So, I mean, it was exactly like you said. You know, I came off Lake Champlain. You know, I was 35 years old. I was truly feeling like on top of the world. You know, I felt like I had just kind of finally hit my like full stride as far as swimming went and that I could like literally accomplish anything. Um, I had already like signed up to do my four-way English channel swim. And like, I was just like ready to rock and roll. I was daydreaming about like all the, all these other swims that I wanted to do to get ready for this, you know, upcoming four-way English channel swim. Like literally for the first time in my entire life, I felt like, unstoppable. And then I found a lump in my breast and, you know, waited probably too long as women typically do before going to the doctor. And, you know, my just normal regular doctor was like, Sarah, this is a big deal. You need to go have a mammogram, like as soon as you can possibly have a mammogram. And so I went through a mammogram, did a biopsy and, you know, it came back as positive for breast cancer. And it was, you know, one of like probably the most surreal moments in my life, you know, I'm laying on a table, I'm looking, you know, a doctor is doing a biopsy and she's being very kind. And, you know, some people, when I say this, they're like, I can't believe she did this. But like in my memory, I'm very grateful for her. But, you know, she told me, she said, you know, the images that I'm seeing from your mammogram, this is breast cancer. And, you know, we've got to wait for pathology to come back to confirm it. But like, you need to prepare yourself that you have breast cancer. And, you know, she ripped the bandaid off for sure. You know, and I'd gone to that appointment alone. You know, my husband had offered to come with me. I didn't think they were going to tell me anything. And so I remember, you know, it was late November. So I'm sitting in 
you know, my car and a parking lot in the pitch black. And I've got to call my husband and like, tell him like, Hey, this doctor just told me I've got breast cancer. And it was probably one of the hardest things that I've ever like had to say out loud to somebody. Um, And I could just, you know, he was at work, you know, probably an hour away and he was like, I'm coming, you know, like, don't, don't move. You know, I'm, I'm coming right now. And it was, you know, it was hard and it was really, really terrible to go from being on top of the world to like, Hey, we don't know if you're going to be able to swim again. Like we didn't know what was in store. We didn't know what my treatments were going to entail and how they might impact my ability to keep going long distances. And, you know, it's a, it's really hard mentally and emotionally to have that switch, you know, and I know a cancer diagnosis is awful no matter where you're at in your life, but it was just so unexpected to be 35 years old, no family history coming off this like incredible athletic achievement. And all of a sudden I'm a cancer patient by Christmas. How quickly did things move? Like when did you get sort of a plan for your treatment and were you able to to swim? Like, did you want to swim during your treatment or, or did you lose your desire? I wanted to swim. You know, it was definitely the one thing that made me feel pretty normal. I will say from when I got my initial diagnosis to when we started treatment, things moved really, really fast. I was diagnosed with what's called triple negative breast cancer. So it was negative for any type of hormones, which means it's a particularly aggressive form of breast cancer. And so I think, you know, I waited a little bit too long to go to the doctor initially. And they were like, we've got to get this going. And so I think it was about three weeks from initial diagnosis to when I started chemo. And so just from like the biopsies, I had to have a a port placed. And so, you know, I was forced out of the water for about a month after my diagnosis. And so by the time I was able to like actually get back in the water, I was already like losing my hair from chemo. And I remember just like, walking onto the pool deck for that first swim and just feeling like self-conscious and like, I didn't know how it was going to feel and just kind of like, just not terrified. That's maybe too strong of a word, but just uncertain as to, as to what to expect. Um, it was really nice. I had a couple of friends who had agreed to come meet me for a swim. And so, you know, I told them like, you guys go ahead, start without me. I I need like a minute alone. And I'll never forget what it felt like just to like slip into the water and just to push off the wall and to realize I still float. It's going to be okay. No matter what happens, I can still float. So I did, I actually swam quite a bit during chemo, probably three to four times a week, nothing long, nothing crazy by any means, but it was just nice to have a routine and to be in the water when I felt good enough to be in the water. The longer chemo went on, the more tired I got. So pretty frequently, my husband would just drive me down to the pool and sit and wait while I swam. So I didn't have to worry about being too tired to drive back home. And so it was just kind of nice. You know, I made it a a rule that I swam every morning before I went to a chemo session. Um, So I'd go, you know, straight from the pool to get chemo. And sometimes I'd come in, my heart rate was still pretty high. And the nurses were like, what is going on? And I just got out of the pool. It's okay. (laughs) But I do think it gave me, it just gave me something to kind of hang on to a piece of like normalcy in a period of time where life was very much not normal. And I did, I mentioned earlier, I'd already scheduled my four-way English channel swim. And so that was still on the books for 2019. So it's 28, early 2018, and I'm going through all these cancer treatments and I'm like holding on to all of my hope that I'm going to be good enough and better in time to swim the English channel in 2019. Did you ever feel as though you needed to like, not let go of the goal, but is that what kept you going like through those like really tough times? I would say early on, like when I first got my diagnosis and like, it's just bananas when you first get a diagnosis, there's so many appointments and scans and blood work and procedure. Like the, you know, the first two months I would say were just crazy. And you could not literally think about anything else other than taking things one day at a time. Cause it's like each day brings something new and terrible with it. Um, So I will say, you know, probably in those first couple of months, I was not thinking about anything other than just like surviving. But we did um, an ultrasound on um, my tumors, 
part kind of like halfway through chemo, which would have been kind of an early, like oh, midwinter, maybe it was like February ish. And we could see that the tumors were like really responding very well to chemo. And so it was kind of in that moment that I was like, okay, maybe I can breathe. I think I'm going to be okay. And so it kind of from that moment on, it was like, okay, I think this is going to be all right. Let's kind of get back to focusing on something that I can't control. And, you know, that's this big goal. And so, you know, started talking to my doctors about like what's going to happen to my swimming. You know, when we're thinking about the types of surgeries that I needed in my surgery options, because I knew we had to have a mastectomy on my, you know, right side where all my tumors were, you know, but talking to them like, okay, what, you know, what type of surgery is going to really help me to be able to continue swimming, right? Because if you're doing an implant, it's going to be under your pec muscle and I need my pec muscles to swim. So like, what are my options here? You know, and I remember talking about like radiation and talking with the oncologist there and saying like, okay, are you blasting my lungs? Am I going to lose lung capacity for, you know, swimming? Um, And just like, you know, all these questions about like, how is this treatment going to impact my swimming? And what can we do to, you know, keep my quality of life and to, help me to be able to keep swimming when this is all over. And I really do feel lucky that I had doctors that were open to those types of conversations. Some of them, especially my plastic surgeon, I think to this day thinks that I'm insane, but, you know, he was willing to work with me and talk through things and to really, you know, even though he thought I was crazy to support me in my journey, uh, which was really nice to have that from the medical side. So what did you choose? What did you do? So we ended up doing just a mastectomy on one side rather than both sides, which is, I don't know what it's like in England, but you know, here, most people just do bilateral mastectomy. They remove both breasts. uh, They do implants, you know, on both sides, you know, they just knock it out and get it done. And so we elected to just do one side, which I'm super grateful for because I can you know, I really feel the limits in my range of motion on my right side, especially when I compare it to my left. And I cannot imagine having done that to both of my shoulders. I do think that would have caused me problems in the long run for swimming. I could not get away from doing an implant under my pec muscle. I will say, you know, kind of the process for that is probably, I don't know if I'm getting too granular here, but they give you what's called a um, an expander. So that goes in first after you, you have your mastectomy, they put in an expander um, and then they do basically what it sounds like is they inflate the expander as much as possible uh, before you go into radiation because radiation shrinks everything down. So like I came out of my mastectomy, which I tell people I had half of a boob. And then over like the next month we expanded it so that I had like a boob and a half. (laughs) And then I went through radiation and it shrunk everything down. And tissue expanders are super uncomfortable. They're really hard. They're just filled with saline solution, basically. But it felt like having a softball sewn into your chest. And we left it there. You know, normally people keep those in for a couple of months following radiation, and then they switch them out for like a softer, more natural implant. Um, But we left it because I had all these upcoming swims and I didn't want to have to go through another surgery, another month or two out of the water following surgery. So we just left it until I was done with all of my swimming for 2019 and then kind of continued on with um, my reconstruction surgery. Have you noticed so with the implant, like how does that work in like cold water? Does it make a, can you feel it? Like, does it make a difference in your body? Yeah, you know, I was really concerned with how that was going to go. I'm not going to lie because, you know, once you have a mastectomy, you can't feel anything, right? So like I have no sensation kind of from, you know, just below my shoulder down to like where your bra hits and then like into my armpit and like along my side. So I can't feel any of it. There's no sensation at all, unless there's like a lot of pressure there. And so I didn't know, like, is cold water going to be dangerous for this? Like, what's going on, you know, like what's going to happen, which is also why I'm kind of glad that I kept my left side because it gives me at least something to be like, warning, warning, (laughs) like it's not okay. You know, I can't feel it, but it doesn't cause problems. Let's put it that way. The four way English channel swim. When did this become a thing? Like where swimming four four ways back and forth? Uh what's the story what's the history about about the four-way the four-way swim basically in 2016 I was training for my Lake Powell swim which was 80 miles and 
like really kind of loving the training, kind of really into it in 2016. And I was crewing an English Channel swim for a friend. And I'm, you know, sitting on the boat while he is swimming. And I'm kind of like looking from England to France, you know, like back to England, you know, and I've got like 11 hours where I'm just kind of like back and forth. And, you know, it kind of brought back all these memories of just like how special the English Channel is. I mean, I'd always kind of thought I would go back and do a double English Channel. And that was kind of like in the back of my mind, like, you know, I probably, you know, it'd be fun to do a double English channel, but I'm sitting on this channel boat watching my friend and I'm training for an 80 mile swim. And I said like, okay, if I succeed in Lake Powell, I'm going to come back to the English channel and I want to do something really special here. Lake Powell is 80 miles, a four-way English channel is roughly 80 miles. And I was like, you know, if that goes well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to come back and try this four-way English channel. So that dream really started in 2016. I came off, you know, like Powell, like super successfully, right? You know, I was, you know, itching for a hundred miles in that moment. So, you know, I was planning the English channel four-way and my hundred miles in Lake Champlain at the same time. So, you know, like it was not long after I finished Lake Powell that I like reached out to Eddie Spelling, who was my boat captain in 2012. And I was like, Hey, Eddie, (laughs) you know, like, what do you think about this? And he, you know, he follows me on Facebook and he, you know, he saw that I had just done, you know, 80 miles in Lake Powell. And he was like, well, you know, I think if anyone can do it, you probably can. So he found me a slot, you know, the first available slot was in September of 2019, where we had a good window, you know, he gave, I don't know how much you know about how it works when you wait your turn for the English channel, but he basically had a a two and a three slot or sorry, a three and a four slot on one tide. And then he had the whole next tide completely open still. So he signed me up for a, a three and a four and a one, two, three and a four on the next tide in September of 2019. And so that was kind of, all right, here we go. It's booked. I paid a deposit in like March of 20, 2017, I think. Swimming in a lake 80 miles, so the distance is going to be the same. Does Lake Powell have currents? I honestly don't know, because obviously the English Channel does have currents. But how does that work? You know, Lake Powell did not have currents, but I will tell you, people ask me this a lot. I truly think that freshwater swimming is harder than saltwater swimming. Saltwater makes you float. Right. So yes, in salt water, there's jellyfish and the salt water makes you chafe a little bit more, but fresh water just puts so much more pressure on your joints. You know, in Lake Powell, I hit like a pretty steady headwind for like eight hours, you know, just like blowing in my face, you know, and that is I'm telling you dealing with something like that is harder than probably pretty much anything I've experienced in the ocean. So I knew that the swims would be pretty comparable as far as like time in the water was going to be. I feel ridiculous asking this question. Like, what I was about to say, <laughs> like when did it get hard? Because actually the whole thing is, <laughs> is hard. Like it's not, I mean, I was thinking like, I have obviously, I have not done swimming, but like, when did it get harder? Or when did it really become a challenge for you based on your experiences, the distances, you know, the, the, the things that you've done previously? So like, when did the English Channel four-way get hard? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I would say I probably hit my real low point at the halfway mark, right? So I swam from England to France and then I was back in England. So, you know, I've been on the water about 24 hours and I was like sick. You know, I think I was seasick. There was something in one of my feeds that was not hitting my stomach well. It was the middle of the night, right? We started at midnight. So 24 hours later, it's midnight again. I'm like exactly where I started. And it's like, what's the point in all of this? You know, I'm puking my brains out. And I'm like, this is really dumb. <laughs> um, you know, in any swim that you do, you have a moment of like, this is a really stupid idea. I don't know what I'm thinking. And I had a probably about, I don't know, six hours in the during the four-way where I was like, I do not have what it takes. You know, like I am mentally toast. I've been puking my brains out for a real long time and this is not fun, but you know, I'd been in those situations before in Lake Powell. I had, you know, a few hours where I was like, this is miserable. Like I'm really miserable right now. Uh, Lake Champlain, there was several hours where just for whatever reason, I was sad. I still don't know why I was sad, but like I sobbed in my goggles for like three hours and have to stop and like, 
emptied my tears out of my goggles because I was so sad. And those are just things that you just, you push through, right? You're like, you accept the fact that you're miserable. You accept the fact that you're sad. You accept the fact that you're puking and you just, you know, keep pushing through one stroke at a time, you know, especially in the, in the four way, you know, I'm, I'm a year out of my cancer treatments and I'm like, this is not worse than cancer, you know, and you, and you think about that. You're like, I want to be here. I'm blessed to be here. Like I am really miserable and I'm really sick, but if we can stop the vomiting, like I'm going to keep going. And, you know, you just keep yourself present in the moment you deal with the problems as they come and you keep swimming. Were you able to take like anti-nausea medication, like when you're, when you're swimming or would that, can that like impact other parts of your body? They let me vomit for a real long time before giving me some anti-nausea stuff. Unacceptable. Uh, right. Give me the yeah. meds now. <laughs> yeah. We didn't exactly know what to expect, but I did. I had some, it's called Zofran. They give it to pregnant women basically for like morning sickness. So it's a pretty gentle drug, but it helps with like nausea. And so they did, they gave me um, a couple of those. I puked up the first one they gave me. So I don't think it had a time to do any good. Uh, But by the time the second one got into me, um, the sun was kind of starting to come up. And then I just felt a lot better when the sun came up. And yeah, I don't know. um, I puked for a real long time. Um, So I don't know what would have happened if I had kept puking. Because at some point you're like, there's nothing left in me, right? Like at some point you have to have hydration or else you're just going to hurt yourself. And I think we were close. You know, the observer was on the boat and the boat captain, and they were telling my crew, like, you got to figure this out. Like she can't keep going like this if you don't figure it out. And we figured it out and, you know, the sun came up and I remember hollering up at everyone like, sorry, I was so whiny last night. I feel a lot better now. (laughs) Yeah. And we just uh, kept going. I believe there was a bit of a challenge with, um, especially on like lap four with the current sort of like wanting to push you out, <laughs> push you out to yes. the sea. Yes. What happened there? You know, when we were planning for this swim, Eddie had told me, he said, if you make it to France for, you know, a triple English channel. So if, if you're there and you turn for lap number four, I promise I can float you back to England like a log. <laughs> And so I finished the three way and I was right on schedule, right? We nailed the cap every single time. Like I was not falling apart. I was, you know, feeling better. You know, I was like, like right on schedule with the tides. And so when we started back towards England, I was like, okay, I got another like 12, 13 hours max. I'm going to be back in England. Like this is going great. Like the weather forecast was still good. Like everything was fine. And then I hit the 48 hour mark and we had kind of thought it would be a 48 to 50 hour swim. And so I hit that 48 hour mark and my friend Craig got into pace swim with me and he was like, so Sarah, you're stuck in a current. I really need you to give us like an hour of power to break through this current and get into British inshore waters. And that was kind of my first indication that things were not going well. And so I was like, okay, fine. Like, you know, I can't be that far off if I'm almost in British inshore water. So yeah, sure. I'll sprint for this hour. And, you know, maybe it'll, you know, maybe I'll, you know, take an extra hour, maybe an extra two hours to get there. And so I sprinted with Craig and, you know, like two hours later, my friend Elaine gets in and she tells me that I've got like another 10 K and I'm like, oh, like if I've got at least another 10 K, that's like another three hours. And I'm like, I thought I would be done now. And you're telling me that I've got at least another three hours and possibly more. Like it's kind of mentally, that's really, really hard to come back from. And at some point you just have to let it go, right? You're like, okay, this is not going according to plan. You know, I've got earplugs in. I'm really tired. I'm not going to understand what's happening exactly. They can't, we don't have time for them to like give me the detailed explanation of why it's not taking 12 to 13 hours right now. I'll get the story when I'm done. And so you do, you just kind of have to put your head down and just, all right, I guess we're just swimming longer than we planned. Uh, But it's really hard to let go of that when everything you you know is that it's going well. And then all of a sudden the currents are not being kind and it did, it tried to push me out to sea. And there was a few moments I think in there at that 48 hour mark where they were like, if she doesn't pick it up and get out of this current, we're not going to finish the swim. The thought of the thought that you've been swimming now for like 48 hours uh-huh. and the captain obviously you know said from a nice place 
I just need an hour of power. You know, just yeah. need to, you know, up the ante. Let's just sprint for for a little bit longer. Obviously, you should get out. The, there's a there's a reason. There's a rationale. Right. But, but also an hour of power when you've probably already given it your all. How can you swim fast? Like how how can you up? How do you up the ante? How do you take it to the next level? How do you th- how do you increase the speed? You have to, you know, like there's not a choice. If you know, if the boat captain is telling you hour of power, you have to find it deep within you to do that. And so for me, I don't kick a lot when I swim. And so, you know, if they're telling me, Sarah, go faster, that means, all right, I got to get my legs involved. So my goal is to kind of pick up my stroke count just a little bit and start kicking. And that usually gives me just a little bit of an oomph um, to get over that hurdle. Now, if they had said two hours of power, I don't know if I could have done two hours in that moment, but you're like, okay, it's just an hour. Let's put my head down. We're just going to focus on swimming hard and nothing else. Are you able to listen to music or not? It's just earplugs. Mm -mm. Just just earplugs. Yeah. You can't, it's tough because you can't, especially at night, you can't really see anything or hear anything. And so you're, you're left alone with your thoughts for a really long time. Where do your thoughts go? Do you, do you, I know it's probably going to sound weird, but do you even think, are you even thinking, or are you just so zoned out? So, or zoned in, so focused, or are there songs playing or, you know, that's a long time to be in your own head in the pitch black, in the water. I would say it's a little bit of both. You know, my favorites are when you're just in la la land, right? Your 30 minute feeds come in a blink of an eye and you're just swimming and you're kind of in a flow state. Um, I will say in the four-way English channel, I don't know that I ever got there. I kind of feel like I felt every single stroke uh, just because, you know, I was sick or where I was worried about the current. So you're, sometimes you're singing songs. Sometimes you're telling people off. Sometimes you're telling people you love them. Sometimes you're writing your life story. You know, your mind just kind of flits and floats to everything that could possibly be be going on in your brain in a you know regular day, I suppose. Do you think you could have turned around and gone again? Oh, that's a good question. I was pretty spent. If you asked Eddie, the boat captain, he'll tell you his biggest regret is not turning me for lap number five. He thinks I could have done it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Like, is there a seed of uh, like, oh, could I, could I go further? Could I do it? Could I do it again? Like, would you want to go back and to see? That's a good question. I don't know. I've thought about this. Um, do I want to go back and and try for five? You know, I think I'm pretty content with four. It was a good swim. You know, I came out of it unscathed. I recovered quickly. I think I'm really happy with four. <laughs> and by the way, that's, that's, you can be like, that's good. That's, that's allowed. That's like, okay. Like, yeah. that's, it's incredible. Like, when did it sink in about what you'd achieved? Has it sunk in? You know, I, sometimes I don't know that it actually has completely sunk in. It's something that I did and I, I, I see what it looks like to other people, but to me, I was just out there doing, doing my thing, you know, doing something that I love. And so I don't, I don't know. People ask me that because it's like, it's a massive, enormous swim that I did. And I don't know, like it it didn't change my life. You know, like I, I went back to work, you know, a week later. So I don't know if it really, I don't know. That's a good question. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not being articulate on that answer, but I don't know if it, it really, I don't know if in my mind, I've really truly grasped what it means to have swum the English Channel four times. What are the, some of the future swims that you'd like to do? What's on your, do you have a bucket list of swims? You know, I just um, did a 50 mile swim in Lake Mead last weekend, which is, you know, the biggest reservoir in the, in the States. You know, I finished the swim at the Hoover Dam. I'd been dreaming about that swim for a couple of years. And so, you know, at this exact moment in time, I'm feeling really satisfied. You know, I just, you know, I just checked off a bucket list swim and it was a beautiful, amazing swim. So I'm just like super happy with that. I will say, you know, I've got an itch for, you know, I did a hundred miles in a lake, you know, I think part of me would really love to do a hundred miles in the ocean. That's not planned or, you know, there's nothing on the, uh, on the calendar for that right now, but, you know, I think 
some point in the next couple of years, I'll probably be finding a route so that I can, you know, have a hundred mile ocean swim and a hundred mile lake swim. Sarah, have you ever thought about doing the Ocean Seven? Is are those swim like on your on your bucket list, on your dream list? Um, some of them are. That's actually a more complicated answer than you might be expecting here. So I have two left. Technically, remaining is the swim in the Suguru Strait, which is in Japan, and then Gibraltar. And I would love to do both of those swims. We actually went to Japan in July to try and do that one of the Ocean Seven. And um, we didn't get to swim. The weather was bad. And then um, the organization that takes swimmers in Japan no longer takes swimmers as of next year. And so I don't know when I'll be able to get back to Japan to maybe knock that one out. Um, But hopefully I'll get Gibraltar done here pretty soon. I've always wanted to do that one. Looks like just a super fun, fun swim. So I've got two left um, of the Ocean 7 and we'll see when it gets done. It's not a main driving force in my motivation but um, we'll get there eventually why are they no longer taking swimmers does that mean that that's will be like fully crossed off that it's just not you just can't do it anymore i don't know the answer to that so they had some drama this summer where they took 13 swimmers to try and attempt that swim and not a single one of them made it and so there was kind of an outcry because they set up a whole bunch of different rules Um, This year, you can't swim at night. They made up this like imaginary straight line down the middle of the of the straight where you're not allowed to cross because they think if you cross over the line, you won't be able to make it back across the current. Just all these crazy things. There was a swimmer who did go with a different group who was successful. So of 14 attempts, one person made it and with a different group. Um, And that group, the pilot is really old and he doesn't want to take a lot of swimmers. So at some point, I don't know if another group will come forward or if there's, it's just not very organized there. So I don't know that it's going to get crossed off the list or replaced with another one. I don't, I don't have the authority to make that happen, but um, right now I'm just going to sit and wait and see what happens in Japan. And maybe someday we'll get to go back. It was a, an incredible country. We loved our time there. I'm just really unfortunate what is happening with that swim. And I suppose with the logistics, you can't really sort of take your own boat captain over because you probably need somebody who knows the water, the current, right. <laughs> what is going right. on in that yep. experience. And actually, I suppose if there's not that many people doing it, then maybe there isn't the financially worth. Yeah, okay. Do you know, no, yeah. do you know, but that's really fascinating. So thank you for yeah. sharing that. Yeah. And Sarah, you know, where are you most active on social media? Where how can people follow along, keep up to date with your, you know, your future, your future swims, your future challenges? Where should they go? Sure. I have Instagram, um, Sarah Swims04. You can find me on Facebook. I've got a public Facebook page, which is Sarah Thomas Open Water Marathon Summer. I do have Twitter and TikTok, but I don't use those nearly as much. I think my handle is the same as Sarah, Sarah Swims04 for those as well. But um, Instagram is probably the best place to find me. Awesome. And it is the Sarah Swim, is the 04 for the, for the four way channel swim? No. <laughs> <laughs> wait no 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 wait hold on you weren't born in 2004 were you no so <laughs> many many moons ago when I got my very first email address SS Thomas which are my initials was already taken for an email address and so I thought I was planning way far into the future by using 04 which would be the year I graduated college in my email address so I picked an email address of SS Thomas 04 And then the zero four has just stuck because anytime I try and do like a Sarah Thomas or a Sarah swims, it's always taken. So the zero four has just followed me. So maybe it was fitting. Maybe when I was 16 years old, um, I knew that I was going to do a four way, (laughs) but I don't know. Maybe the number four is my lucky number, but there it is. (laughs) Oh, Sarah, thank you so much for for speaking to us today. It's been incredible to speak to you. And I would love for you to share your final words of advice, final, you know, words of wisdom for other women who and, and you can take this in any direction whether it's you know who, going going through going through a tough time or they're wanting to up up their swimming or even you know take on like a new challenge apart from just do it what advice would you like to share you know what have you learned from your different challenges and your different swims that you'd like to to share with our listeners I guess my advice to people just in general is that if something is important to you and you're feeling called to to do something you know whatever that might be i just think it's so 
valuable to make time for yourself and to figure out the steps that you need to take to answer that calling, whether it's to swim a 5k or to swim 20 miles, you know, or just to pick up a new hobby, whatever that might be, that's important to you. Like there is a a way to make it happen and you just have to find the way to prioritize that and figure out the first step, whether that's reaching out to a friend or finding a coach or just, you know, getting a support system in place to allow you to follow your dreams. You know, I feel like, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how come you're so resilient? You know, where do you get your drive? And I know it's because I just, I have the ability to say like, this is something I want in life and I want to make it happen. And, you know, I've surrounded myself with people, you know, my husband, my family, my friends who like support me in those dreams. And it's really nice to have just a team around you that like believes in you but you have to believe in yourself first. So, you know, if you're, you've got something that you want and you're not sure where to start, just take the first step, you know, tell someone about it and make it happen because it's totally worth it to follow your dream and to prioritize you as a human being as the most important. Absolutely. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on Tough Dog Podcast. It's been amazing to speak to you and just best of luck with all your future adventures and challenges. Thank you so much. Hey, hey, tribe. I really hope you enjoyed the episode with Sarah Thomas. What an absolute inspiration. A four-way channel swimmer. Just incredible. I do want to take a moment to thank and also introduce you to our fantastic sponsor, Zolio, who is going to be sponsoring the Tough Girl podcast throughout January with two episodes going live every week, every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. UK time. Now, Zolio really is a game changer for adventurers and women who love the outdoors. But what is it? Basically, it's a global messaging and safety solution that ensures you can stay connected no matter where your adventure takes you. So I've been using Zolio now since April 2023 when I first started out on the Camino Francis. I've used it in France, Spain, Wales, England and currently been using it while I've been out on the Tiara Roa Trail. With Zolio, you can send and receive messages, share your location and even access weather forecasts all through your smartphone. Zolio allows you not only to stay connected with your friends and family, which gives your family and friends peace of mind while you're out adventuring and traveling, but it can also give you peace of mind while you're out walking, hiking, exploring, because you know if something does go wrong, you can get help. So whether you're out exploring remote trails, embarking on challenging hikes, challenging swims, or simply going off the grid, Zolio is a must. It's such a reliable companion for anybody who values connectivity and safety in the great outdoors. There is more information about my New Zealand hike and Zolio on the Tough Girl Challenges website. So go to Tough Girl Challenges, toughgirlchallenges.com forward slash challenge with Zolio. Thank you again to Zolio for their support and for helping us bring you these inspiring stories of adventure, All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all. Give it 110%. Get after it. Go for it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care. Lots of love and I'll speak to you soon.